Thank you for coming. Uh, hello, San Francisco. <laughs> Always wanted to say that. Um, so my name is Jeremy Khan, and, and I want to I want to start this talk off with a, a simple uh, showing of hands. Who here loves to solve problems by writing code? Awesome. That that's just what everybody in the room. That's what I was hoping for. Uh, who likes to solve problems again and again by rewriting code multiple times? I'm surprised there's actually a non-zero number. So um, most people don't, and we shouldn't because that's not, that's not what programming is about. Uh, we want to reuse code to solve our problems. Uh, this talk is going to uh, cover three main things. I, we're going to talk about some, some high-level patterns for code reuse. We're going to talk about how to write your own JavaScript library uh, that, you, that you can share and, and reuse for yourself. And I'm going to show you a small project that I put together to make it all a little bit easier. This is the goal for today. We want to make this work everywhere that we want it to run. This is just a simple AMD compatible module. It's, uh, it's getting a file called library and it's creating a new instance of it. It's a pretty simple goal, but it can be a little bit harder than you might think. So first off, hello again, who am I and why are you listening to me? My name's Jeremy Khan. I'm a web developer at YouTube and I love writing open source JavaScript libraries. I've written a few in, uh, for fun in my free time, and it's it's a really good learning, uh, really good learning exercise, and I've made some cool things with it. If you want to find me online, I'm Jeremy C. Khan on both GitHub and Twitter. So check me out. I love this quote: "No problem should have to be solved twice." This is taken from Eric Raymond's "How to Be a Hacker" guide. I believe it's step two. Uh, it was, it, was, it was meant in the context of more Unix hacking and like more old school like C++ type things, but I think it really applies to the concepts of code reuse and not wanting to uh, you know, uh, have to rewrite anything. So it's a bit of a contortion of the uh, original idea, but I think, think it still holds. Code reuse is king. This is what we want to strive for, writing things once and reusing them again and again. Now, when I say code reuse, I don't mean copy and paste. It's kind of a weird, uh, kind of a weird terminology uh, connection, but copy and paste means that you're, you're literally taking code and you're copying it around the file and you're just creating more complexity and you're killing your maintainability, and that's bad. Code reuse means that you're using the same piece of fun functionality for multiple uses from different points of your code base. That's good. So you're isolating the complexity and you're making maintain maintainability much easier by localizing all of, all of your problem solving into one specific area for a, specific, for, for a certain problem. So here are two large patterns for code reuse that we've, all, we've probably heard a lot, thrown, thrown around a lot. Frameworks and libraries. Uh, it seems that not a lot of people actually know what the real difference is, so we're going to go in and we're going we're, we're to really define these terms. A framework is a mechanism for structuring an application. This is more of a higher level, uh, a high level tool, and you basically, it, it, it gives you an entire skeleton for how, how to build an app, and you just kind of fill in the little gaps with your own application specific code. Examples of frameworks include uh, Ember, Angular, Knockout, and Clojure. There's a few others, but these are the big ones, uh, especially uh, Ember and Angular. These are the newer tools, and these are great. So if you're building a large application that you want to scale, definitely check out these frameworks. A library is a little bit different. It's a little bit smaller in scope than a framework. Uh, and a library is just a module for solving a, a specific problem. You can almost think of it as like a utility for solving a certain need that you might have. Examples that we know and love are jQuery, Backbone, uh, Require, and Underscore. The list goes on. There's a ton of really great fr frameworks out uh, written by the JavaScript community. So how do these two uh, compare? There's a lot of confusion as to what, you know, what defines something as a framework and what defines it as a library. It turns out there is actually a, a very strict differentiator, and that is something called inversion of control. Inversion of control uh, it, it basically refers to what is controlling what in your application. And what I mean by that is that frameworks control your application code, and your application code controls libraries. So it's a bit of a hierarchy. So you've got frameworks at the high level, application layer in the middle, and then your libraries at the bottom, which there can be any number of. So what that means is that you can have any number of libraries, but you really only want to have one framework. 
One way to think of this is that a library is like your wrench and a framework is, is like your entire workshop. You can have many different kinds of tools. You can have, you know, wrenches and screwdrivers and uh, buzz saws and whatever you need, but you only really work with, within your one big, uh, your, your one big workshop. Um, also, you, you, you don't have like multi-tools because, well, I'll get in that in a second. But we're not focusing on frameworks today. Today we're talking about libraries, something that is really awesome. And they're reusable solutions for common problems. Now, when it comes to actually writing a JavaScript library, there's really no spec or standard. There's really no quantified set of rules to follow. It's just um, some basic pre best practices that have emerged out of real libraries out in the wild. Um, and really, what, what, uh, the way that I look at it as is it's, <clears throat> it, it's the comparison between very good ideas and extremely bad ideas. So let's check out some extremely bad ideas first so we know what to avoid. Really, when you're writing a library, you want to follow the same principles as writing unobtrusive JavaScript. So the things that you don't want to do when you're trying to do this is you, almost mo most importantly, is you don't want to modify built-in prototypes. You don't want to extend or augment uh, objects prototype or array or anything like that because other, other third-party code um, uh, in your environment may be expecting that to work a certain way. So your best bet is to leave things in a natural, neutral state. So don't modify these prototypes. You also don't want to make assumptions about the environment that your code's going to be running in. What I mean by that is that if you have some code that's uh, dependent on certain WebKit APIs, you, you may not want to use those. That's not to say that you can't. You can use WebKit or Gecko specific libraries or specific APIs. But you either want to normalize that functionality across the different environments, or you want to thoroughly document that your code will and won't work in certain environments. Another, th another thing to avoid is uh, excessive dependencies. You want to make sure that your code only uh, uses uh, external dependencies that it actually needs. Uh, that's, again, that's not to say that you can't use dependencies. Just kind of be aware of, of, of the bloat and the, the technical debt you're bringing into your project when you require more and more dependencies. A good example of what not to do is that a while back, I, f I found this timer library that was, I think, less than 1K. It was just a small little utility library, but it required jQuery. And I looked at the source, and the only reason that it required jQuery, which is a, like a 30K library minified in gzipped, the only reason it required that was to, to use the dot each function, which is not really a significant component of jQuery in terms of the overall code base. So um, that is an example. Sorry if that person's in the room, by the way, but um, that's an example of what not to do. So what are some things that we do want to do? What are some good ideas to follow for writing unobtrusive uh, JavaScript libraries? Uh, the, 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 the easy slow hanging fruit is to minimize your global variables. You generally don't want to expose more than one global variable. And if using something, uh, if using an AMD compatible lo loader such as require.js, then you can actually get away with uh, exposing no globals at all, which is awesome. You want to make sure that your library has a small and focused scope. You want to keep it simple. I was mentioning before that you want to avoid things like a multi tool. And what I mean by that is that. If you're working in a workshop, going back to that metaphor, you have a bunch of specific tools for, for everything that you need to do, you know, specific uh, screwdrivers and wrenches and so on and so forth. And if you, you, you probably don't want to use uh, one of those multi-tools because it's usually not very good at any one thing, doing any one, any one thing well, and it's also kind of unwieldy. So keep your libraries small and focused. And your library should just work. Uh, the best kinds of libraries, the ones that we really love, you just drop them on the page, they do what they're promised, and they don't do anything else. They don't break any other code. A great example of a library like this is Modernizer. You just load Modernizer, it, it does some tests, it, put things in the, it, put, uh, it puts some classes in, in your code, and it just does its thing. And that is the kind of API that we want to see. Another thing that you want to do if you're writing a JavaScript library is to adhere to, uh, to a standard module compatibility format. So these are the big four right now. We've got CommonJS, AMD, UMD, and ESHarmony, ECMAScript Harmony. So how do these break down? At a high level, CommonJS is what's used on the server. 
This is the, uh, the package format that Node uses. AMD stands for asynchronous module definition, and this is a, a great tool for loading modules in the browser. Uh, asynchronous is in the name, so it can actually get multiple modules uh, asynchronously and then load them and resolve the dependencies on the fly. So that's great if you need to make multiple requests. UMD is sort of a, like a love child between CommonJS and AMD. Um, I haven't used it myself, but it, lo it looks promising enough. And it's great if you need to normalize between the environments, but it kind of muddies up your code a little bit. So uh, take it with a grain of salt. And the last one is ES Harmony, because uh, the JavaScript li uh, language authors have realized that this is a problem that, ne that needs to be solved at a language level. So they're working on a specification to actually build this into the language. It's not quite ready to roll yet, but it is in the works. Always be testing your code. You should never not be testing your code. And it's especially true if you want to distribute a reusable library. Uh, you, you want to make sure that your code does as promised. And an automated testing suite is the best way to do that. You can think of it as a way of proving that your code does what it says it's going to do. There's great tools out there for this. Uh, I think the big three right now are QUnit, Jasmine, and Mocha. I prefer QUnit because it, it just kind of works. Uh, Jasmine and Mocha are also very good. They have a bit of a different syntax, but definitely check out whatever tool works the best for you. So I love semantic versioning. And this is something that not a lot of people talk about. It's kind of like um, people kind of generally accept the concepts of se semantic versioning, but it's, it, people don't really think about the actual definitions of it. So when you've seen large open source pr uh, projects such as jQuery or Linux or something like that, They've usually got a number.number.numbers format, and that sometimes adheres to semantic versioning. So you can see the definition for semantic versioning. It's actually a, a pseudo spec. You can see it's, it's semver.org. It was written by, um, the, the website was written by uh, Tom Preston Werner, who is the CEO of GitHub, I believe. Uh, but it basically breaks down to these three different parts. You've got uh, three version numbers, major, minor, and patch. And the most important number to, to this versioning scheme is the leftmost number, which is the major version. In this case, we've got 0.12.6. Uh, the, the idea with the, with the major version is that if you're not 1.0 yet, if you're at 0 dot whatever dot whatever, you're free to change the API because it's still considered to be in development and unstable. Not that you should go willy-nilly just changing the API because you may have lots of users, such as Backbone or Node, but still, uh, the API is free to change uh, and, and still, you know, conform to the standard. Uh, but once you get to 1.0 or above, the API is effectively locked down. So if you change the API such that it breaks uh, current users of, of that major version, so if, you, if you're in version 2 dot something and uh, you, you change the API so it'll break things for current users of, two, of that major version, you have to increment it so it becomes 3 dot something dot something. So it's, it's a way of kind of um, promoting s more stable APIs and you know, putting some more thought into how your API is going to look before you actually finalize it. The middle number is the minor version. You can, uh, you're, you're free to make API changes that, aren't, uh, th that don't break backwards compatibility. And th this is handy if you just want to add certain features to your API but still you know, not break things for, for older users. And the last version is the, is the patch version, and this is just for small little bug fixes that come up, and this shouldn't break anybody's code. The reason that we have this semantic versioning scheme <clears throat> is so that we can, uh, so that users can make sure that a, a certain version, a certain major version of code is going to run on their system, so they can freely upgrade to the next major version of, of a package and know that it's not going to break their code. We want to optimize for the modern developer and the modern developer's tool chain. So what does this look like? Here are three big package managers, NPM, Ender, Jam, Bower, and Yeoman. And the, thing, the ones that we really want to focus on here are NPM, Bower, and Yeoman. Yeah, my color scheme is good there. Um, Ender and Jam are, 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 are good projects, but they never really caught on that much. And they're a li little bit older, so uh, 
it's better to look towards the future at things like NPM and, and, and Bower because they've got more community support, at least for the moment. And it's got a little bit more, there, there's a bit more developers backing them, it looks like. Yeoman isn't necessarily a package management tool. It is a, it does get code onto your system, but it, 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 it's a, it gets packages, but it also does a whole lot more. And I uh, believe that Paul Irish is giving a talk on that tomorrow. So if you want to learn more about Yeoman, which looks really cool, you should see his keynote. So there's a lot of details if we want to write JavaScript and, and distribute it and make sure that it works for everybody. We need some way of kind of reeling in all the, all the madness so we can build on top of these, on top of these rules. I built a small project called libtemple. It is a template for unobtrusive, scalable JavaScript libraries. It's a, it's a library template, not a template library. Uh, so it's a, it's, it's a bit of a distinction there. Um, the idea is that you take libtemple and then you just change what you need to build off of the pattern that it's already set out so you can add more and more of whatever you need to it. The idea is that you don't use it as it is. It doesn't really do anything as it is. It's more of an educational project that you can build on. If you want to check out the source code, um, it is on my GitHub. It's right there. Uh, I didn't really know what to do about the name because it is a library template. I didn't want to give it like a weird name that was, you know, you know, might mean something else. So I just called it what it is and took out some letters. <laughs> so it's libtemple. It is modeled after two libraries that I've written called Recappy and Shifty. Uh, these are some some animation libraries that I've talked about in the past, and. The reason I wanted to use these projects is because I developed a pattern that worked really well as I was building these out and adding more features and making them work for me. And it's also important to note that I didn't uh, come up with a lot of these patterns myself. A uh, few small parts, but most of it was taken from, from other projects that I had seen, especially jQuery. Uh, there's a lot of great ideas from other projects that, can be, that, that, that were used to make this, all, this whole thing work together. So what does a libtemple library look like? Well, it uses uh, kind of more old school object oriented uh, uh, constructor patterns. So you, it basically exposes one single object. You can give it static properties uh, and, and private and public properties. And this is how we create a new instance of a libtemple library. And the, the object that it exposes is called library. You're definitely going to want to change that change it to something a little bit more helpful for you if you, ch if you decide to, to build on top of this. So we just create a new instance of it. And you'll notice that this is actually taken from, that, from the snippet at the beginning of the presentation where it was wrapped inside of a uh, require block. So I'm going to show you the, the structure of all the files, but the thing to keep in mind is that all these files are meant to be concatenated into, concatenated in, into one single file. You don't want to use any single file of this whole project by itself. It's all meant to optimize uh, development for you, the developer, so you can uh, easily uh, compartmentalize functionality into, into separate files. Here are the five t uh, file types in libtemple. Uh, intro, init, core, module, and outro. Now, intro and outro is an idea that I completely stole from jQuery because it's so awesome. And intro is just the beginning part of a, a function clo closure, and outro is just the, uh, the, the, the ending of a function closure. So what we wind up with is something like this. So we've got intro, some code in the middle, and then an outro. And what this does is it just, it, it just protects uh, the, um, everything that we're doing inside of, inside of code there from the global scope. So really intro and outro are just kind of like tiny little files. Ramping things up a little bit, let's take a look at init.js. So init.js is kind of your doorway into the library. This is what, what, what bootstraps the whole thing and gets code running and, and, and uh, gets code into your environment. It does something kind of handy. It normalizes AMD and non-AMD environments. Uh, I actually took this pattern from UMDJS, which is linked up at the end of this presentation. And what that means is that if you want to, to load a libtemple library through a script loader such as require.js, you can do that and not expose any global variables, which is great. And if you're not using a script loader, if you're just using script tags, you can, uh, 
uh, libtemple is compatible with that too because of this, this abstraction layer. So, and it's still pretty small. Uh, we still haven't like ma made any functionality to make this thing live or breathe yet. And that's what core is for. So core creates the library object. A few slides back I showed you uh, new library and then parens. And that's what, th that's what core is creating. It's creating a constructor function and it's also creating some basic utilities that are available to all of your modules. So let's take a look at what that looks like. So it's a little bit, uh, bit ugly, but let's focus at the top here. Uh, we have some basic utilities that can be used by all of your modules. Everything in this, in this highlighted section is going to be within the scope of all of your module files, which I'll explain in, in a moment. Uh, but you can define anything that you need, a constant, uh, any kind of private m methods, whatever you need. And the real meat and bones of this is this, uh, we, we've got this wrapper function called init library core. And it just gets context uh, as a parameter, which is either the global object, if you're not loading it via AMD, or it is the, um, the AMD context that you loaded it in. And all this does is it creates the constructor function and it, it, and it can do any number of things uh, like uh, adding methods to the prototype or just adding any other um, utilities that you need. But this is how you start, create, this is how you start with uh, creating the object. So now that we've got a knit and core out of the way, we have any number of modules. I put a little asterisk next to module.js because you can have uh, one or many of them. They do that they're modules and you can kind of pick and choose what you need and add them at, at will. Library modules are awesome. Uh, this is kind of the fun part of a libtemple library. Now, when I say library modules in this context, it's a bit of a weird terminology, I admit. I just didn't know what else to call them. So when I say library modules, I don't mean AMD or common JS modules or anything like that. Uh, when I say modules in the context of <clears throat> libtemple, I'm really more referring to, uh, uh, to different files. So a great, ex a great real life example of, of this pattern is again jQuery. So if you look at the source for jQuery, like under the source directory, you'll see module, uh, see, see files for Ajax and core and um, animation and CSS and a whole bunch of others. And the idea is that they're, uh, th that they're separating code out into separate files so it's easier to develop. So it makes sense when someone wants to add or change or, or figure something out, they can just go into whatever you know, module it's named after. So it's, it's a way of optimizing for you, the, d the developer of the library, to keep your sanity and not have one giant file for everything. So what is a, what, what is a libtemple module really doing? And I just want to say that you, um, again, going back to the uh, differentiating the different module types, is that you don't want to, uh, you don't ever want to use a, a module by itself. It's just, um, it's part of the build process. So these, these modules are just a wrapper function that just decorate the object that was created in core. So here's an example of a, uh, of a library module. It's pretty similar to core because core actually is a module. It's just a, a module with some extra sugar on top. But inside of this wrapper, we're just, we can create more constants, create more private variables or uh, private methods that are, that are specific to that functionality. And we can also add static and uh, prototype methods. Again, the idea is to uh, only add things that we really need in this particular module. So if this module is doing things that are, that are CSS related, we would have them in this module, not another one. And this uh, wrapper function gets called in a knit, which is where, where everything gets tied together and bundled. Oop. So we have this nice pattern for separating code out into separate files and keeping smaller files that are easy to manage. What are some other nice things that libtemple gives you? It starts you off with a, with, with a reasonable sane directory structure. It's not that big of a deal, but uh, some people yeah, uh, they're not really sure where to start when, when structuring, it, structuring their directories for an application. So I, I've taken a lot of hints from other larger projects and kind of uh, uh, distilled it into, into a more generic pattern. I've given you a unit testing bootstrap with QUnit so that it's really easy to start writing tests. You don't have to use QUnit, but it works and it's pretty easy. So that's the default. 
but the most fun thing is the build script. Now this, is, th this does some pretty cool stuff. LibTemple uses Uglify.js. Who here has heard of Uglify.js before? Okay, about half of you. Great. Um, it's awesome. It is a JavaScript compiler and it can uh, concatenate, and comp concatenate and compress different JavaScript files into one single minified binary that's, uh, that, that you can then deploy to your users. But it does something that not a lot of people are really talking about. It lets you create custom binaries. Let's dig into this a little bit more. Compiler directives rock. So compiler directives are not a new concept. It's actually from, this is a decades old concept. The C and C++ guys have been enjoying this for way longer than we have and the JavaScript community is just finally catching up with great tools like Uglify. The idea behind uh, compiler directives is the ability to customize your binaries for specific targets. So if you wanted to have the same code base compile into a target for, um, for, for, for the browser and for Node and for Arduino and for OS X or whatever, you could just turn off certain flags and customize your binary at, at build time. So the syntax for doing this with Uglify.js is a little bit wonky. It's kind, of a, it's kind of a hack, but it works. And let's say that we want to have some, de some debugging code that gets exposed only for our unit tests, but not in the compiled binary, or for the deployed binary. So we could have some, uh, a variable called debug. It's gonna check to see if debug is undefined. If it is undefined, we're gonna globally define it as true. And then later on in the code, uh, if we wanna add a certain test hook function, we can just see if uh, debug is truthy and then just expose that, f th that function globally. So here's kind of an ugly snippet from the build script, but um, it's called Uglify.js for a reason. Uh, but the relevant part here is right in the center here. So we can see that we're defining debug as false. So when Uglify.js goes, is compiling your code, it's gonna assume that the variable debug is false. So let's look again at the, uh, at the code inside of our source. It's gonna see, it, it's doing a type of debug equals undefined. Well, false isn't undefined, so that's actually true. Uh, I'm sorry, uh, de debug is not undefined, so it's not gonna mark it as true. And then later on the code, it's gonna see if debug is, is true, and that code's never gonna get run. And the way that this works is that Uglify is kind of using two features of itself to make a better feature. And when it sees code that can't be run, something that's, for example, marked in a false statement like this would be, uh, like if false, then it actually removes that code from the compiled binary. So we can conditionally turn off and on certain segments of our code. And this is really handy. Another way to think of it, is, as I said before, is you can, compile, you can make optimized binaries for Node. So it's the exact same pattern. Uh, if Node.js is true, then we expose this Node.js specific method globally. And this is how it, how it would look in the build script. You just add as many of these compiler directives as you need. So there could be one for debugging, Node, browser, the sky's the limit. So this is pretty cool. Now the point of all these little tools that I've built into LibTemple is to build better tools. We want to find patterns for building better tools and we want to build a community because this stuff is awesome and we don't want to have to re keep resolving problems. So let's stick to some better practices for writing better tools. A great, uh, a great place to find new tools is microjs.com. Microjs is a website that was created and, maintained, and is maintained by Thomas Fuchs of Scriptaculous and Zepto fame and it's just this really nice repository of curated uh, micro libraries, meaning they're under 5K. So you could uh, check out the, the libraries on this list here and see what works for you and just see what people are making. So definitely check it out. Thank you. Were there any questions? <laughs>